Uh, welcome to this COVID-19 clinical TA webinar series hosted by USAID's Sustaining Technical and Analytic Resources and the University of California, San Francisco Institute for Global Health Sciences with support from USAID's Oxygen Ecosystem Initiative. Over the next hour, we're gonna talk about oxygen concentrators. Um, I am joined today uh, by my colleague, Robert Neighbor, uh, an engineer, uh, fellow of the Institution of Engineering and Technology. Robert has spent uh, a large proportion of his career um, designing uh, both oxygen concentrators and a wide variety of medical equipment for use in harsh environments and resource variable settings. Um, an honor to have Robert join us here today. And I'm Michael Lipnick. I'm an anesthesiologist and critical care doc at the University of California, San Francisco, and director of our Center for Health Equity and Surgery and Anesthesia. So as mentioned, today's focus is gonna be on oxygen concentrator basics, how to set up, operate, and perform routine maintenance on these devices. Just as a general reminder, we are recording this and it will be available to review after. Uh, it will be posted on the Open Critical Care portal and on YouTube. Um, also as a reminder, this is not intended to provide clinical recommendations. Um, any reference that we make to specific equipment, uh, devices, it's not meant to be an endorsement of those devices. And please check all the manufacturer's recommendations when using uh, any device oxygen concentrator um, along with your uh, prescribing clinician. This webinar is being broadcast in Spanish, French, in addition to English and those language options can be selected from the, the menu um, at the bottom or top of your screen, and the recordings and all of those languages will be available afterwards. At any point, please submit questions using the Q&A, and we'll address those as we move through the webinar, but we'll also have some time at the end for Q&A. Another reminder just to highlight where some of the materials that we might be mentioning can be found. Um, the majority of them will be at the opencriticalcare.org portal. Um, some of the treatment guidelines or clinical protocols, if we reference, can be found at the COVID-19 treatment guidelines dashboard or covidprotocols.org. Just to highlight a couple of specific resources that we'll be mentioning. One is a top 10 list for tips when buying a portable oxygen concentrator. Also linked uh, on the portal um, is this oxygen concentrator specifications and tip sheet. We're gonna go through all of the specifications and why they matter, but we're trying to compile a list of different manufacturers and models so that you can try and sort through which can uh, conform to the WHO um, specification recommendations. There's a series of infographics which can also be found on the Open Critical Care Portal. Uh, some go through the basics of operation and maintenance, uh, and then a couple others on combining or splitting oxygen concentrators. And we'll break these down over the next hour and go through them, but they are there for your reference. They can be downloaded and modified for your local uh, setting. Finally, for uh, uh, any audience members who may be performing um, maintenance or inspections of the equipment. There are a couple of resources that we've highlighted here uh, that have some um, cover some of the basics about uh, a bit more in-depth troubleshooting or um, repairs on these devices, which uh, we'll, we'll touch on, but are a little bit beyond the scope for this particular webinar. So just to summarize the key messages of what we're going to be going through, first off, always check the manufacturer's manual and recommendations prior to use. Although a lot of these devices are very similar, there are significant differences between different manufacturers and models, and it's worth uh, taking a look at, um, at those manuals, including the service manuals. Um, these differences in performance can result in significant differences in the capability of these devices to take care of patients, especially those with acute um, illness where their needs may be changing um, uh, dramatically from day to day or even hour to hour. Uh, Try to use um, oxygen concentrators that conform to the WHO technical specifications. Again, that's linked from the portal and we'll provide a link later in the talk. There are a few simple practices that we're gonna go through that can really help improve longevity and safety of operation for these. These include making sure that you're keeping the filters clean, 
not exceeding the maximum uh, capabilities of the device and making sure that they're connected to a good stable power supply. Uh, additionally, making sure these are positioned in a safe space away from anything that may obstruct the air inlet filter, away from any potential fire ignition sources. And then finally, uh, last take home message is that splitting and combining um, has been well described. This can be done, but there are some key principles that need to be followed in order to do it safely. So with that, let's jump into it. Um, in terms of uh, terminology, just a couple of things to get out of the way. Uh, when we're talking about flow rate, we're talking about the oxygen coming out of the concentrator in liters per minute. Um, what's coming out, we'll often talk about, uh, we'll talk about the concentration of oxygen or the percent of oxygen that the concentrator is generating. And then finally, we may use the word PSA or pressure swing adsorption. This refers to the general way in which these devices operate. There are a couple of different variations of this, but this is the most common that we would be throwing around. There are two different types of oxygen generator, generally speaking, that we're gonna be referencing here. Um, portable or bedside oxygen concentrators, which function with by using pressure swing adsorption, and we'll talk about that in a sec. And then there's stationary, um, and these are often referred to as oxygen generating plants. The oxygen generating plant is the larger image on the bottom left, and the concentrator, the portable concentrator or bedside concentrator is what we see um, on the top right and for scale at the bottom right. So if we wanna talk about the basics of a PSA plant, we probably need a simplified uh, diagram, but for those who want a little bit more info on how these work, um, you can check this one out. We're gonna go ahead and simplify this um, for the purposes of this talk. Essentially, the way that a pressure swing adsorption device works is it sucks in room air, and room air, we're talking about air that is only has a concentration of 21% oxygen. The majority of the rest of that gas is nitrogen, and there's a small amount of argon and other gases. As it enters the machine, the first thing that happens is it's filtered. A filter will try and take out any gross particulate matter, dust, things that can really damage the internal workings of these devices. Um, in many of these devices, there's a, actually a series of filters, and we'll talk about those a little bit more. The next step is to compress that gas, bring it up to pressure, and drive it through these two sieve beds. Um, the sieve beds, uh, you can kind of think of as filters, and they're filled with this substance on the left. Um, there are a couple different ways that these can work, but here we show zeolite, a compound that uh, works like a filter, but it basically filters out the nitrogen. You can think of it as, as working in that way. And so the oxygen, and also argon, um, will pass through, and that concentrator will output a higher concentration of oxygen than went in. Um, now the, con the concentrator will also uh, purge the nitrogen out um, through a different channel that's not going to the patient. But what's coming out of the flow, me flow meter should be a higher concentration of oxygen. And generally the recommendation is this should be higher than about 82%. Um, quick note on zeolite, a common question that comes up is how long does the zeolite this, matil this material in the seed beds that filter, how long does it last? The short answer is it's highly variable and depends on how that unit was cared for um, and the operating environment. A good uh, rule may be around three years, um, 15 to 25,000 hours of continuous operation. This is gonna vary, again, depending on how it's taken care of, the operating environment, and also the manufacturer's recommendations. Always check the service manual. There will be some mention of this in there. This is just to highlight, uh, it's an old technology. This has been around since the 1950s, um, but it did become a lot more popular in the 1980s when, it be, when oxygen concentrators um, were approved and now paid for um, in the US uh, as part of Medicare expansion. So now let's talk a little bit about setup and operation. I'm gonna go through a few slides uh, over the next 20 minutes or so going through the basics of setup, and then we'll hand it over to Robert, who will demonstrate uh, on a couple of different oxygen concentrators what we're talking about. So the first step is positioning of the unit. Always make sure that the unit's positioned in a safe place, keep it away from fire potential fire ignition sources. So we're talking about no smoking, keeping it away from uh, open flames and cooking, grease. Um, another key uh, aspect of the setup 
is to make sure that it's positioned away from a wall or away from curtains, any objects that could potentially obstruct the air inlet filter, which is this dark gray square uh, in many units is, is in a similar position on the back of the unit. So take care when positioning these. If that gets obstructed, it can limit the ability of the machine to function. It can also uh, stress the machine and cause um, potential damage over time. Next step in the setup would be attaching a humidification bottle. Now the humidification, the role of humidification in patients on um, low flow oxygen is, is somewhat debated. Um, it is often prescribed when rate flow rates are above four liters per minute. Um, the goal is to, to make patients more comfortable and to keep their mucous membranes from drying out. The actual benefit in terms of outcomes in adult patients is not well established. And so you may uh, find variety of practice patterns on, on whether or not this is, this is deployed. Um, if you do use uh, humidification, uh, you need to use clean water. So water that's not um, kept clean uh, can cause buildup of bacteria um, and potentially increase the risk for infection. Um, ideally using sterile or distilled water uh, that doesn't have uh, particulate matter in it um, or minerals that can over time potentially lead to buildup and occlusion of, of the device. Um, always inspect the humidification bottle, especially the outlet. Um, it's a common place for obstruction to take place over time. Um, if you are using humidification, you're gonna to wanna to replace the water and inspect the bottle um, every day. And again, just to highlight role of humidification in adult patients is not well established with regard to outcomes. So next up in the setup of a, of a concentrator, you're gonna to wanna to inspect the air inlet filter. Um, make sure the inlet filter is first of all, present. Um, it's not uncommon that these might be removed and not replaced. Um, and there may still be a plastic grill on the back and you might not notice that there's a piece missing. So always make sure that there's an air inlet filter on the back. It usually looks like a black piece of foam, which we'll show in a, in a little bit. Uh, make sure it's clean and dry. Um, the filter should be inspected every day, uh, but it usually won't require cleaning more than one to two times weekly, depending on the operating environment. In very dusty environments, it may need to be uh, cleaned more often than once a week. Um, cleaning these uh, is pretty simple. We're talking about washing it in some warm water, maybe with um, some mild soap. They should be rinsed and then dried with a towel. Um, do not put these in, um, in a machine um, and they must be completely dried before putting back in the machine. Ideally having two of these, um, if you're gonna be using the concentrator continuously, then while one is removed for cleaning, you can put in your spare. And then as the, your second one is, uh, or your first one is drying, um, then you can be using the next one for the, for the next few days. Uh, so keeping a spare air inlet filter is, is not a bad idea. When you do clean the air inlet filter, um, you should be able, if you hold it up to light, to be able to see light coming through it, just to give you kind of a rough sense of, of function. The air inlet filters uh, are a big deal. So this is one piece of, uh, and the key messages from this, taking care of that air inlet filter is really critical to the life of these. Um, this is a, a device that's operating in a dusty environment um, and without proper care of that air inlet filter, you can see what happens um, just on the inside of the machine. Um, you can imagine that in those two uh, long silver cylinders, which are the sieve beds, you can imagine that dust getting in there, um, those could potentially look bad and, and not function um, nearly as well as they should. Now, the device that we're showing in, in these diagrams is not um, representative of all oxygen concentrators that you might be finding. So just wanted to throw another in here. This is a, a member of the NIDEC Nuvo family. Um, the concentrator looks fairly similar. Um, in the left-hand image here, you can see the air inlet filter. It's more of a rectangle than a, than a square as in the prior images, um, but can be removed just with your, your hands, um, similar to the other one. Um, the other thing to point out is uh, a lot of the, the components of the oxygen concentrator are, are the same. We have a, at the top right image, we have a flow meter, we have a power switch, we have the oxygen outlet number three. We also have number five, which is a, um, a circuit breaker. These may be in slightly different locations depending on your unit. Um, on the bottom right panel, you'll notice that behind the air inlet filter, so we're looking at the back of this concentrator, the air inlet filter has been removed as has the, the plastic grill. 
And here's where the hour meter is found. Um, whereas on some devices, the hour meter, um, which is tracking how many hours the device has been in continuous operation and can give you clues to, or, or some indicator when you might be needing to perform service. Um, that hour indicator sometimes is on the front, sometimes it's on the back and a little bit more hidden. Okay, so now jumping back to our diagrams. Um, next up in the setup would be connecting and powering on the unit. Um, before you power on the unit, always check the back of the device near the power cord. There should be uh, instructions on the specifications of what type of power the device needs. Um, make sure that you're plugging it into that correct uh, power supply, otherwise you can um, damage the unit uh, permanently. Um, now, in some operating environments, which we'll go into in a little bit more detail in a minute, um, consider adding a voltage stabilizer or uh, uninterruptible power supply. Um, at a minimum, a surge protector in between the unit and the power that you're gonna be using. Try not to use extension cords uh, simply because of tripping hazard um, and also increasing the risk of failure in the circuit. Um, if somebody requires a um, continuous use of the oxygen concentrator, somebody tripping over it and disconnecting it obviously can cause some major problems. So when we have the unit and we're getting ready to plug it in, uh, before you plug it in, you can flip on the power switch and test to make sure that its failure alarm is working. Um, if, if it is, the oxygen concentrator, even though it's not plugged into the wall, should sound an alarm to let you know it's not plugged into a wall. So you can test that out before you, before you start using it. Um, once you've done that, you can plug it into the wall. Each time the unit's turned on, an alarm should sound, but it should uh, silence itself automatically. So listen for that to take place. Also listen to make sure the compressor comes on. It shouldn't be subtle. You should hear the compressor. You should also feel flow coming out of the device when you open the flow meter. So those are just a few uh, basic checks to, to get out of the way. Um, most devices should have an, a low oxygen concentrator, a low oxygen indicator light, um, an alarm, which will go off if, if the concentration of oxygen coming out of the unit is less than 84%. One thing to note is some devices do have a warm up period of anywhere from uh, two to 20 minutes to reach the desired oxygen concentration. And then finally, the surge protect button in the NIDAC model, we showed it um, uh, on the, the front panel here, number five in the top right. Um, if there is a surge, that button may need to be pressed. So we talked, I mentioned this voltage stabilizer issue. Um, a lot of people ask, how do I know if we need it, if I need a voltage stabilizer? Um, if you have freak, if you're where the concentrator is going to be used, if that setting experiences frequent power outages or commonly uh, has issues with lights dimming or flickering for periods of time, then there's a pretty good chance that the local power supply is unstable and could cause some damage to the device over time. And so um, using a voltage stabilizer uh, is likely to be beneficial. You can also check the voltage. Um, and, uh, and I'll defer to Robert, who can comment on that a little uh, in a little bit. Um, Another point, can I use a power inverter commonly comes up. If you get a device that's not um, for the power supply um, that's available locally, getting a power inverter to, to try and convert the power, this can be done. You need to make sure that you get a power inverter that can handle the amount of power that's needed. Not all can. And then one note is that if you're using devices that are not designed specifically for the local power supply, it's only a matter of time before somebody uses them um, without an inverter uh, and damages the unit. So um, if it's an option, always make sure to buy something um, that is uh, kind of as foolproof as possible and designed for the local setting. In terms of um, flow, this is uh, an important note. So the device, most devices will have a flow meter um, on the top front of the panel. Um, you can see it here blown up. This particular flow meter goes from zero to 10 liters a minute the range of flow is gonna be different depending on what your device can put out. Some devices may only put out five liters per minute, um, some even less, um, and some devices may not go all the way down to zero liters per minute on the flow meter. Um, they may have a, a minimum flow of closer to two liters per minute. Um, the relevance of that is if you're using the, the concentrator to take care of um, infants or neonates or, or uh, patients that you wanna have um, less flow, then you would need a, a, another flow meter downstream. So um, when adjusting the flow meter, always follow clinician's advice on um, the oxygen saturation goals for the patient. 
um, which should be checked with a pulse oximeter. Um, there's a ball usually in these devices, adjusting them. The middle of that ball is gonna indicate the flow. Um, you should always feel flow coming out of the meter. It should be pretty obvious. If you're not, then there's something wrong. Um, a big take home from this slide is to not exceed the max rated flow of the device, even though some flow meters will allow you to adjust them so that the, the ball, um, the flow meter will go above the max flow. Try to avoid doing that. That can significantly decrease the efficiency of the machine. It can also cause damage to the machines as well. So that's a big, uh, a big tip to avoid. And then the final step, once your oxygen concentrator is on, you've done all your tests, um, is to connect your oxygen delivery device. Shown here is a face mask or nasal cannula, which are two devices commonly used in patients who are needing five to 10 liters per minute or less, um, which is the most common amount of oxygen that uh, most concentrators will be producing. A couple of additional things just to, to highlight. Um, check the manufacturer's specs, but try and avoid using more than about 15 meters of total, total tubing length to the patient. Um, consider using something to secure the connections to prevent your oxygen uh, tubing from blowing off or disconnecting from the flow meters. You could think about using cable ties. And then just to reiterate, oxygen can cause fires um, if it's around an ignition source. Uh, so please make sure to position these in a safe place. All right, we'll talk now uh, the next couple of slides about tips for procurement. And again, there's some resources on the portal to go through this um, in more detail. Um, a lot of concentrators that are out on the market, especially right now, are not adequate for taking care of patients with acute respiratory illnesses like COVID-19. They just simply do not make enough oxygen, um, despite sometimes what their claims are um, or what's in the fine print. So always choose a device in consultation with a healthcare provider. The WHO has produced some great technical specifications for portable concentrators that are worth reviewing if you're, um, if you're gonna be using or procuring. And then as part of this, make sure you have access to spare parts, including the delivery devices, um, and if you're using humidification, just keep in mind clean water source is going to be needed. Um, so just a couple of, of things to think about um, when getting ready to, to get or operate a, a concentrator. There are a handful of uh, great research that's been done out there to compare oxygen concentrators. This particular paper was done by Robert. Um, we can comment on this a little bit later or if folks have questions. Um, but performance testing is really key to these concentrators. There are lots of concentrators on the market that will claim that they have certain performance capabilities, um, but in reality, there are significant differences in how these devices perform, especially in real world scenarios of harsher environments, dusty environments, high temperatures, higher humidity, et cetera. So I'll talk a little bit about the rationale for some of the specifications around um, concentrators. Most of this is a summary of what's in the uh, WHO specs. Um, so you can read more about it there. Just gonna touch on some of these briefly at this point. Um, power, we've already talked about power a little bit, making sure that it's compatible with local power supply, um, but also power efficiency, um, ensuring that the amount of power that this oxygen concentrator consumes um, is, re is a reasonable amount, not so much that it's gonna cause power supply issues um, no matter where it is. So I think the recommendation is uh, less than about 70 watts per liter per minute, um, but please reference um, the WHO specs on that. That's an that's a important one. Um, flow output, as mentioned before, most commonly concentrators are in the zero to five liter per minute range, um, not infrequently can go up to 10 liters per minute. There are devices that can produce more than 10 liters per minute. Um, They're less common, but a big thing to remember with flow output is the oxygen concentration. Many devices will claim they have high flow output um, or some that even claim their flow output is in the five range, but the concentration of oxygen at that max flow may be completely inadequate. And thus the flow output is in itself is not a good measure of, is this device sufficient for my patients? So what you really want is, you wanna make sure that the oxygen concentration at the max flow that the manufacturer is reporting is greater than 82%. Really in most devices, in most cases, is gonna be 90% or higher. So that's a big one to keep, uh, keep an eye on and is a common, um, a common place where manufacturers unfortunately uh, can be misleading in, in the advertisements for these devices. Um, 
temperature, um, altitude, just the operating environment is important. So um, by WHO specs, these devices should be able to maintain that max oxygen concentration at the max flow rate, or excuse me, they should maintain a, uh, an oxygen concentration of greater than 82% at the max flow rate at the, uh, at, in a harsh environment. So at a temperature of 40 degrees, a relative humidity of 95%, um, et cetera. So keeping an eye on that's important. The devices are loud, so noise is a factor, making sure you don't get something that uh, doesn't have adequate noise dampening. Most of these devices um, are designed specifically to try and keep noise down. You can imagine if this is in somebody's house in a small room or somebody's uh, on a, a ward with 10 or 20 of these devices, it can be extremely loud and interfere with other aspects of care or, or daily living. So noise is a big one. Durability. Um, you want to make sure that these devices are rated to withstand minimums of, of dust and some moisture. Um, so all should be reporting their uh, a rating of durability. Outlet pressure um, is kind of the last one that we'll touch on here. Um, you want to make sure that outlet pressure um, is at least uh, 55 kilopascals. Um, this is a, a technical specification, but it's important. Another piece of this, though, is also making sure that the device operates under a stable pressure range. Um, some devices that operate over a wide range, that can be a clue that they uh, um, are not as high quality. Okay, so a common uh, question that comes up, can I use an oxygen concentrator with a ventilator? Um, and it depends. Um, most ventilators, that is not the case. Uh, most ICU ventilators uh, will require a high pressure oxygen source, and these portable oxygen concentrators do not produce oxygen um, at 50 PSI, three and a half bar, they're usually closer to 20 PSI or less. But some ventilators can. Um, another factor here is the patient. A lot of patients, even if using a ventilator that can accept a low pressure oxygen supply, they may simply need more oxygen than can be provided when using a low pressure supply. For example, the Zoll 731, the LTV2 or LTV2200, and the uh, uh, Medtronic PV560, they can all be connected to an oxygen concentrator, a low pressure oxygen su supply. However, the maximum concentration of oxygen that they can then deliver is going to be different. Um, for example, the Zoll 731 and the LTV2, they both can deliver close to 100% oxygen concentration if the flow input matches the patient's minute ventilation. And what that means is if a patient is breathing really fast, they're going to need more oxygen. And if they're breathing faster than 10 liters per minute and your oxygen concentrator maxes out at 10 liters per minute, you're going to have a problem. They're not going to be able to keep up. So you got to know what your vent can do and you need to know what your patient needs and what the oxygen concentrator can deliver. Um, on the PB560, um, it delivers a max of 50% FiO2 um, with uh, up to 15 liters per minute going into um, directly into the device. So oxygen splitting, this is going to happen. Um, this happens in many settings, and there's a lot of improvised ways that this can happen. Um, you can see a cylinder here being split with a stethoscope on the left. Um, a con in the middle image, a concentrator being split uh, with some uh, different pieces of IV tubing, uh, a catheter, um, tape, and then on the right, using a uh, IV tubing and an uh, IV, empty IV fluid bottle. So there are a lot of different ways to improvise splitting. Um, there are some uh, better ways to do it than this, but uh, suffice it to say, there are a number of ways to do it. Um, a common practice is splitting an oxygen, one oxygen concentrator to serve multiple patients. Um, we'll go just quickly through these steps and then a couple of caveats when you're thinking about doing this. Again, always check the manufacturer's recommendations prior to doing this. Um, so one of the first steps is coming out of the oxygen concentrator, connecting to either number one or number two, either a, a Y splitter, if you're just gonna be connecting to two patients or to uh, an actual flow splitter. And we'll show some examples of that in the live demo. Um, if you are using a flow splitter, um, these can be uh, delicate, and so make sure that these are placed somewhere um, where they're not going to get knocked over or dropped. Um, there's some variability in what can be used to connect these, but 
in general, something around a five millimeter diameter silicon tubing. Um, keep an eye on lengths uh, to make sure that resistance is the same. If you use different lengths for each arm of the split, then the flow, the, what the patients may ultimately be receiving is gonna be a little different. So just keep an eye on that. Um, connecting the uh, flow splitter through this, the short silicon tubing, consider connecting it to one-way valves. Um, make sure those valves are connected in the right direction. These valves um, can be uh, procured, uh, they're, they're inexpensive, but variably available. Um, the valves keep your flow splitter from getting potentially uh, contaminated um, uh, if the patient's breathing with the device off. It's pretty uncommon, but that is something to consider uh, to try and minimize um, contamination of the tubing, which may get reused. Um, next up, after the one-way valves, if you're gonna be using a humidifier, um, this would be the place to put it. Um, and then finally, from the humidifier to the delivery device and kind of showing this all put together, starting on the left, we, got a, we have the oxygen concentrator. You'll notice the humidifier is not in place at the concentrator. Um, we're connecting through tubing to the flow splitter in this case. Um, and then from the flow splitter, silicon tubing is coming out. It's connecting to the one-way check valves. Uh, the one-way check valves through a short, uh, piece of tubing is going to the humidifiers, and then each humidifier is going to a different patient. Um, so this may sound obvious, but the flow splitter does not mean that you now can deliver more oxygen than what that concentrator can put out. So if you're using a five liter per minute oxygen concentrator and you split it five ways, the max that any patient can get is one liter per minute. Um, if they're all getting the same amount. Uh, so it has to add up to the same um, as the total output from that concentrator. So generally this practice is gonna be for relatively less ill patients or pediatric patients um, or neonatal patients. So um, just keep that in mind. Um, low oxygen alarm, um, if you're, if you're um, maxing out the unit, um, you may be using too much flow. It may start giving you some, uh, some alarms with that. Um, changing the flow rate on any of the patients may affect the flow rates on the other patients on the splitter. So always check the flows um, for all the patients um, anytime you're adjust adjusting the flows for any patient. Um, again, with humidification, always use sterile and distilled water and make sure that you have the concentrator um, downstream from your check valve and from the, um, from the flow meters um, to avoid getting moisture into the flow meters and then limit your tubing length if you use too much tubing, the resistance can cause some issues potentially. Um, now we can take the, in the alternative scenario, which is instead of splitting a concentrator, um, it has been described uh, using two oxygen concentrators, combining them together so that their uh, output um, takes care of a patient who needs more than either of them can, can supply. So if you have two five liter per minute concentrators, you can combine them together to give a patient 10 liters per minute or two 10 liter per minute concentrators and give 20, et cetera. Um, there are a couple different ways you can do this. Um, the first is uh, at this, this top bar, you can connect the outlet to a simple Y connector um, and then over to the patient. Uh, if you're using a humidifier, then that's the second scenario here. And that humidifier should go between the Y and the patient. Um, if you are, uh, you can, if you have access to bacterial viral filters, inserting that and or a check valve um, before the humidifier um, can keep the, uh, the equipment between that and the concentrator uh, clean. Um, so that is another way to do this. Um, and another way would just be simply to take two concentrators, connect each of them to a delivery device and put both of those delivery devices on the patient. So for example, one concentrator may be connected to a nasal cannula, the other concentrator to a simple face mask and both placed onto the same patient. Um, schematically, uh, just showing number three in that last diagram here, we've got two oxygen concentrators. Again, the humidifier, is not attached to the concentrator itself. Through silicon tubing, we're connecting to a simple plastic Y connector. 
making sure that that Y connector is um, of adequate size to not introduce um, unnecessary resistance is important. From that to a bacterial viral filter and or a one-way check valve to the humidifier and over to the patient. When you're doing this, um, trying to choose two concentrators with similar outlet pressures um, and with the desired combined flow output um, is important. Uh, you're gonna have two devices potentially plugged into the same um, uh, power supply. So make sure that uh, it's not gonna be too much to blow a uh, fuse. And if you can have them on different uh, outlets, even better. Make sure that you, the tubing and the connectors you're using are clean and are large enough that they're not gonna in, impose um, unnecessary um, uh, or problematic resistance. Um, think about securing your connections with uh, cable ties, zip ties, to make sure they don't come off. There's just more potential places for error in this. Um, and then otherwise, similar uh, recommendations as we prior previously discussed, when to consider humidification, um, avoid running above the max rated flow, um, and then check for leaks. If you connect to the patient and this, it seems less than what you'd be expecting, um, look for leaks, look for resistance, and troubleshoot those as they come up. So at this point, I'm going to hand over to uh, Robert, and we're going to go through uh, some demonstration. Um, and if you have questions, Robert, you can go ahead and unmute and begin, and uh, I'll handle some of the questions coming in. We'll save those for once Robert's done with the Q&A, and we'll try and address them. So if you do have questions, put them in there and we'll try and uh, either demonstrate um, or answer them once Robert's finished the demo. Thanks, Robert, over to you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, just to reiterate some of the things that Mike has been through, we've got two concentrators here, they're common models. Um, there are a lot of different types. We talked about uh, a gross particle filter. That's on the back of this one. We can take that off. Um, these do need cleaning regularly, very regular, um, and washing them with water and um, making sure they're dry before you put them back is, is the right way to go. If you do have a spare, then that's always very useful to be able to rotate those. Uh, you should be able to see through it if you hold it up to the light. Um, I have seen cases where people have lost the foam filter and found a piece of closed cell foam and put that in, no air goes through it, and then you're not gonna get the concentrator to work properly. If we look at the other one here, this has a, a gross part of the filter on the back, but it's under a cover. We can take that cover off to see the filter. And this one has a secondary filter inside here. Um, looks like this, they simply pull out and you can replace them. With this one, the secondary filter is inside. You can take the cover off, and that just sits on top here. And so, just a, a simple felt filter. Um, but these do get very, very dirty. I've seen some of these with um, a lot of strands hanging from them, and they block very easily. But they can still be washed. It's better to replace them. But if you um, don't have a spare, you can wash them and dry them out and they work quite well. Some machines also have some internal bacteria filters. Um, these generally are pretty good for a, a good couple of years, even in a, um, a dusty environment. Um, but you can um, see when they are um, used. Um, they will go black eventually and then they have to be replaced. And look on the edge of it, because there is a right way and a wrong way to fit them, depending on the flow rates. The splitting we were talking about, um, you get a range of these little Y pieces, and you can just fit the tubing onto those, and um, you can work them in both directions, really. So if I put the single limb onto here, I can now deliver to two patients. Um, but that's splitting it down 
very simply. So each patient will get exactly the same flow and will be half of what you set on the flow meter. Again, be careful not to go over the rated flow. There are some slightly more complex splitters. Take this one off. This is one that has uh, four outlets and these are valved, so it's a little more um, complicated. And when you take one off, you don't get any wasted gas coming out of them. Um, but they're quite useful. But again, whatever you're putting into it is divided equally to each of the patients on it. Humidifier bottles um, come in a range of sizes. Um, I prefer the small ones because people will change the water more regularly um, with those. If you've got a very large one, you have to make sure that you're cleaning it regularly. Internally, they have a diffuser in the bottom end here. And quite often they get people say to me, the output from the concentrator is much lower than it should be. And it's often nothing to do with the machine. It's this end here, the little diffuser on the end of the tube in the humidifier bottle that gets blocked and crusty and then stops the flow through it. You get more sophisticated flow splitters. So with this one, we've got a, an inlet in here and three flow meters on here for five liters each. But just to confirm, putting 10 liters in to a three-way flow splitter doesn't mean you're gonna get 15 liters out. You will still only get the maximum on here and you have to be careful not to dial up too much um, beyond the, the scope of the concentrator. Mike mentioned uh, problems with voltage supply. Most of these machines will take a little bit of voltage variation, but if your power supply is bad, do think about some sort of voltage stabilizer. Um, you get various types of these, all different um, manufacturers, um, right the way down to simple sort of high voltage detectors that will turn the machine off in time. This one actually has a, a time delay on it. When the power goes out and comes back on again, it's a bit of a rush and you can get very high spikes, which damage equipment. Um, and I'd see a lot of damage done by that. So these ones actually have a time delay. So when the power comes back on, it waits until the power is stable and then it switches the machine back on. But if your power situation is very poor, then uh, you really need to go to an uninterruptible power supply system that is going to give you some battery backup um, and be able to stabilize both the voltage and the frequency. This is the problem when people put inverters on equipment. It will change the voltage, but it will not change the frequency. And you're still either under or overpowering the piece of equipment, and that will reduce the life of it considerably. Various maintenance is easy to do on with concentrators. Um, basically, it's down to keeping the filters clean and checking inside the machine. The picture earlier that uh, um, Mike showed of the uh, concentrator full of dust, I took that picture in Uganda. Um, and although they had the filter in there, it was full of dust um, and the whole machine was very dusty inside. But actually, when you took it apart, cleaned all the dust out, put a new filter in it, it did produce over 90% oxygen. So you can repair these things um, that have got, uh, they may look very poor, but if you clean them up, you can get good uh, supply of oxygen from them. These machines have similar alarms um, and similar displays on the front. So we have, a power surge device here, reset. Um, and I get lots of um, calls saying the concentrator stopped working. And with a small video, you can see that this 
um, search device here has popped out and all you need to do is push it back in. So it's worth asking somebody that knows if you have a problem in the machine before you go starting to take it apart uh, and you may do more damage um, than, than you will solve problems. So um, we have a range of alarms on here that will give you uh, low oxygen, a maintenance alarm. Um, if you over demand for these two in particular, it will alarm and tell you you're trying to take too much oxygen from the uh, concentrator. Uh, lots of them do now put a red band on just to reinforce that you mustn't over demand from them. If you do, you get a moisture buildup in the sieve beds and uh, that will destroy the machine. So it is extremely important not to over demand from them. Uh, there's an hour counter on the front of this one. On this machine, it's on the back. So there are some variations between those. And it is important to, to make sure that you go over it before you um, uh, start the machine up and just make sure that the alarms will work um, when you, if you plug it in and switch it on and then turn the power supply off, do you get an alarm? Will the clinician know that it stopped working um, when, when power fails? So it's important that you just go around the machine, keep it clean, keep it tidy, check the filters, and it should last a, a very long time. I had an email this morning from somebody that had a concentrator, it done 37,000 hours, and it was still producing very good oxygen. So they will last, providing they have that little bit of care and maintenance. Right at the beginning, Mike mentioned about putting it against the wall. If you put this up against the flat wall, you will not get the airflow through it. The machine will overheat and it will deliver low oxygen. And likewise, if you're uh, in a situation where there are curtains, it will draw that curtain up against here. So don't put it near anything that can be pulled against the, the filter itself. I think that's about as far as I need to go, Mike. Thanks, Robert. So we have a couple of questions here we'll start chipping away at. Um, so one has to do with how oxygen, uh, how often oxygen concentrators should be routinely serviced. Um, so we've talked about uh, referring to the, the maintenance manual for the manufacturer, but uh, you know, humidifiers should be checked daily, air inlet filters should be checked and cleaned at least uh, one to two times weekly, depending on the environment. Alarms should be checked with every power on or new patient. Um, along with that would be making sure that the oxygen concentration alarm um, is not uh, activated, indicating there's an issue. Um, and that should happen with every power on or new patient. Otherwise, maintenance is relatively infrequent. But Robert, other, any other high points for uh, answering the question of how often should the concentrators be routinely serviced? It depends entirely on the environment it's working in. If you've got a, a stable power supply, um, a reasonable temperature and humidity level um, in a, a relatively dust-free environment, um, the maintenance is, is absolutely minimal over um, a good couple of years. Um, if you're in 40 degrees C at 95% humidity and a heavy dust environment, then you really need to be cleaning the machine uh, on a regular basis. Um, probably at least once a month. Um, if you do have the facility to have more machines than you use continuously, being able to rotate them on a regular basis so that you can do some planned maintenance rather than leaving it until there's a problem and then trying to fix it, then that's always uh, a good move. I try to get people to have a redundant machine if they can, so that they can take machines out and rotate them and maintain them and do planned maintenance. Robert, another question. When cleaned properly, how long do concentrators, how long can they last? What have you seen? It, it's an extremely good question and one with a very difficult answer. I have seen concentrators that have been running for 10 years. I have seen concentrators that have failed in six months. So again, it probably depends on the environment and the quality of the machine that you're, you're using. Um, there is huge variation between them um, and some are extremely good 
um, very long lasting, others are not. And you should refer to the WHO specifications for making sure you get a good quality machine. Sounds good. Um, we had a, a request, an important note. Just Robert, if you could reiterate the significance of the, um, the issue of having the right frequency for power, um, just, just to reiterate that, if you don't mind. All right. Um, in the US, you're looking at 110 volts, 60 hertz. In Europe and a lot of other places around the world, the power supply is 220, 230 volts and 50 hertz. And it's easy enough to change the voltage, but changing the frequency is much more difficult. But the difference between 50 hertz and 60 hertz, you can roughly look at twice the power. So if you have a 110 volt machine, and you put a, a, a transformer on it to, um, or an inverter on it to make it run from 220 volts, it is still expecting 60 hertz and it's only getting 50. Um, and it will run slow, um, but that usually means that the fans run slow and then they overheat. So it will do damage either way. So if it's possible to make sure that you're um, supplying equipment that is matching the local voltage, and frequency, it is far better uh, to go that way. Thanks, Robert. Quick question on use of extension cords for oxygen concentrators, uh, pitfalls there, warnings that you might have. Um, the, the two issues there for me, one, it's very messy um, and there is a, a possibility of trip hazard. But for anybody that's been in a, a, um, an operating theater or ward um, in a low resource setting, at the end of the day, somebody usually comes in with a bucket of water and throws on the floor. So the, the risk of um, electric shock from that is very high. So try not to use extension cords, particularly multiple ones running from um, one to the other. And there are a lot of um, uh, low value um, extension cords out there with the ability to stick any plug in any socket, in any direction, and they are extremely dangerous. So try to avoid power cords altogether. Um, only use one if you have to, and do try to keep it off the floor if it's possible. Sounds good, thanks very much. Um, a couple other questions that are coming in here, and we will stay on. We've got five minutes left. We'll stand for a few more minutes to wrap all these questions up, so please keep them coming. Um, question, uh, does altitude have an impact on performance? If yes, is there any way that could be compensated? Um, Robert? We... The, the answers to those two questions are yes and no. Um, it, it is affected by altitude, um, and that's down to um, such things as partial pressure. Um, and there isn't really any way you can compensate for that. Uh, if you look at the manufacturer's specification, some are quite low. Uh, others are, are relatively high. Um, so you can get them up to sort of 4,000 meters. If, they, if you've got one that's going above its specified limit, you may find that you'll get an intermittent alarm um, where it's uh, putting out low oxygen levels. Thanks, Robert. And you know, WHO specifications do have an altitude recommendation of I believe 1,800 meters. Some manufacturers have done the testing but not published. Um, I believe that's the case for the NIDAC units, for example, um, after some conversations with, with them. Uh, so just if you do have a concentrator and you're unsure, reach out to the manufacturer. Sometimes altitude testing has been done but not um, reported. And so um, keep, an, keep an eye out for that. But as Robert highlights, not all concentrators will do well at altitude uh, because of the issue of pressure. Um, okay, next question. Um, does one need to humidify air for four to six liters nasal cannula as well, or would it be considered low flow and hence not necessary? Um, if no access to distilled water, what alternatives? So the, I can take this one. So the issue of, of when to humidify is there's not a lot of good data. When you look at, um, this has been studied in, in patients on chronic oxygen up to six liters per minute, trying to look for um, clinical outcomes, trying to look for uh, potential harm or benefit and, and the data just aren't there. Um, certainly you'll encounter patients uh, who will swear up and down that at high flows up to six liters without humidification, they're not as comfortable. And so that's a reason why this is a common practice. But when it comes to outcomes, 
Um, in adult patients, it's, uh, the, the data are, are not robust. Um, with regard to alternatives to distilled water, this has been an issue throughout the pandemic. Um, bottled water, as Robert is holding up, um, so filtered water um, can be used as an alternative. Um, using boiled water, there are there are alternatives that people uh, that can be used safely. Um, but again, uh, if if they do have mineral in them, um, then for some devices that can cause buildup, more of an issue when using it for things like ventilators and heated humidification systems than for um, room temperature bubbler humidifiers. Um, and just to clarify this comment that I made about the efficacy of humidification, I'm specifically referring to room temperature bubbler humidifiers, not heated humidification, which is a more efficient way to deliver uh, humidity and does have different um, impact. Just a, a caution with um, what you're filling them, bottled water you can get everywhere. And if it's changed regularly, that's not an issue. Um, I have seen cases where people thought they were doing the right thing by putting saline in instead. Please don't, it will, uh, uh, clog the um, humidifier very, very quickly. Robert, any tips or comments on solar power? Seeing a lot of solar power to, to power concentrators. Um, any comments on that? Yeah, um, it sounds a great idea. You know, uh, the, the oxygen is coming from air and that's free and the solar power is coming from the sun and that's free. Uh, in reality, it's a lot more complicated than that. Running a single concentrator from solar energy requires a great deal of infrastructure um, and is not really a cost effective um, answer on its own. There really needs to be some form of oxygen storage to go along with it, and then it becomes a little more um, cost effective. But just running it direct from solar, um, you've got to have inverters, you've got to have batteries, um, and it gets very, very expensive. And, and there's a lot of maintenance required for that. Next question. So these issues of quality, how do we know if we have a good quality concentrator? Um, I've heard things like, you know, any, any concentrator that weighs less than five kilos is probably not gonna cut it in the clinical setting. Um, what, what pearls do you have with regard to, how do I know if I have a quality unit and also commenting on price range? What, what prices are, sound suspicious? Um, if you're looking at an, a 10 liter oxygen concentrator um, and it's uh, probably below um, $900, then um, I'd be somewhat suspicious. At the moment, if anybody says they've got plenty of oxygen concentrators, I'd be suspicious. There's been a pretty much worldwide shortage of concentrators for about a year. Um, so long waiting times to purchase now is not unusual. Um, and the big thing for me is looking at the outlet pressures of these concentrators. Um, you want a reasonable pressure above sort of seven PSI probably, um, anywhere up to, to 20 PSI, but also the, the um, range of outlet pressures. If you've got a machine that says it delivers between five and 10 PSI as an outlet pressure, then that's a big swing. And, and that to me tells me that the, the infrastructure within the machine may not be uh, a good enough quality. Thanks, Robert. Just a couple of last questions here. Um, with the three flow meter setup that you showed, and we have a concentrator with 10 liters per minute, the maximum that each could be set to is about three liters per minute. Um, how can I know if the oxygen delivered is rich enough for each column outlet? Um, this is the device you're talking about, and, and you're right. So the three liters um, out of each um, flow meter for the 10 liters that's being delivered by the concentrator. If the concentration falls below 82%, 84%, then the machine will alarm and tell you. Um, that's really the only uh, definition you can uh, uh, of quality that you've got. Um, but I would always always um, revert to looking at the patient as well, uh, make sure that um, the patient saturation is at a level that uh, you actually want um, delivered. And that really comes down to a bit of conservation of oxygen as well. Um, we know we're short of oxygen in lots of places. 
but delivering too much as well can be an issue. Um, perhaps Mike can, con uh, can mention that as well. Yeah, no, cer certainly an issue, you know, titrating with saturation to try and conserve oxygen, but also especially in uh, younger patients or patients that are gonna be on uh, oxygen for a long time, trying to avoid high concentrations has been, uh, has been a challenge. Um, we've got uh, two final questions here. How many times can bacterial viral filters be used? Um, generally speaking, the bacterial viral filter should not be reused um, if you're using them uh, proximal to the patient. Um, so in the circuit of a splitting, um, a bacterial viral filter there that has you know, one end feeding via tubing to the patient, that filter should not be reused um, in, in theory. Uh, another question for, for you, Robert, if a UPS is used, any recommendations on the type of UPS, considerations, how long they'll last, um, et cetera? Yeah, um, there are a number of different types of UPS out there. The lower level um, offline, online type um, do have some um, uses and some give some protection, but the best type of without a doubt are online double conversion. And what that does is it takes um, alternating current um, reduces it um, to uh, direct current and then reconverts it back to alternating current. And that stabilizes it to a tremendous level. Um, so they are extremely good. They're not particularly cheap, but they are very good. Um, the weak point in them is the batteries. And you may find that the batteries, depending on usage, need to be replaced about every three years. Thanks, Robert. Um, had a follow-up question about the positioning of the concentrators close to curtains or walls. Robert, do you mind turn, just spinning it around again and just demonstrating kind of the air inlet and why, that, why that's important? So you've got the air inlet here through the foam filter. If I put this back against the wall, flat against the wall, then it uh, restricts the airflow through it. Um, and that is a, a real issue to the machine itself. I have seen in, particularly in a number of African countries where they've very cleverly mounted these on the wall on brackets. So they're out of the way at the floor, um, which sounded like a good idea, but actually um, it reduces the life expectancy of the concentrator because it stops the airflow going through the back. Thanks for that. And then the final question here, um, We'll take this last question and then just to remind everyone, if you have additional questions, please visit opencriticalcare.org. You can submit questions from the homepage and we'll respond to them um, promptly. So if you think of anything after this, please don't hesitate to reach out. The final question has to do with um, the efficiency of bacterial viral filters in, uh, inside of the concentrator. What, what bacterial viral capability is there inside of the um, concentrators? Effectively, uh, um, you're dealing with room air that we're all breathing anyway. Um, so they don't have too much um, issue. There's, they're not proximal to the patient. Um, there is nothing coming from the patient that is getting to them. It's um, just a purely additional filter. Some concentrators don't put them in at all, um, but I think on balance, they'd probably have a, a reasonable effect, um, but they should be fine for, as I say, about two years inside a machine. Okay, great. So with that, we're gonna go ahead and wrap up here. Um, so just to reiterate some of the key take-home messages, uh, there's some major differences in performance and safety among oxygen concentrators. Make sure to be familiar with the WHO technical specifications and some of the considerations that we've reviewed here today. Always look at the manufacturer's uh, manuals prior to using and, and always procure and use these uh, with a clinician's input. Um, a few simple practices like cleaning the filters, making sure you have good power supply, not exceeding max flow, 
and taking care of the device in general can really improve longevity and safety. Um, be careful for fire risk. Um, and then finally, splitting and combining can be done, but make sure to follow those key principles that, uh, that Robert outlined. Um, a big thanks to uh, USAID and STAR. Um, and if you have additional questions, please don't hesitate to reach out through the Open Critical Care portal. With that, we'll go ahead and conclude. Thank you, Robert, for joining us. And thank you, everyone, for your time.